like, ah, oh, now that I like dead lady plays, I only <laughs> read those. <laughs> Hello, we are here at Sun Sounds of Arizona in Flagstaff, Arizona, and welcome to episode 27 <laughs> of Untamed Shrews Women Talk Theater, presented by the Flagstaff Shakespeare Festival. I'm Becky. And I'm Hannah. Today we are joined by the ladies of Hedge Pig Ensemble Theater in Brooklyn to discuss their Expand the Canon project, which is a database that collects classic plays written by women so that companies can have a resource to find alternatives to Shakespeare and other classic playwrights. And of course, we will just chat because they're also some of my favorite ladies that I met at the Shakespeare Theater Association, and I miss them tons. But before we jump over to chat with the hedge piggies, <laughs> Becky, how are you? I'm doing mostly well. Yay. Um Yeah, it's, I feel like it's been just a wild month. There are hills and valleys <laughs> and everything in between. Um, something that was not funny in the moment, but is funny now <laughs> is a couple weeks ago I woke up with morning with a bloody nose and it lasted for f- over four hours yeah and I had to go to the ER and they had to put what they called a rhino rocket up my nose mm. and wow does that just make you feel like shit <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that that never happens again never because it was awful yeah um, it was a it was a long day. It was a long day. It was a long day. It was yeah. It was truly terrible. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm doing a lot of um, like just existing right now, and yeah. it's been really nice to not kind of be accountable to anybody but myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in this moment of my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I still have some pretty low days, but I think. That's kind of just par for the course with where I am right now. Yeah, um, absolutely. Which sucks, but... It's also so snowy that sometimes it's hard to have a good day. Yeah, <laughs> the weather truly impacts mm-hmm. mood. Um, yeah. I mean, it's been great to, like, not... To, like, be inside. You yeah. know, like, to have a reason to be inside. But then at the same time, it's like, but I really want to go for a walk. Yeah, do something. Or, like, that this thing with friends was canceled. Yep. Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, later this month, I'm going uh, back east for my sister's bridal shower, yeah. which is really, really exciting. So fun. Yeah. Um, I love wedding stuff. <laughs> it's so fun. Yeah. Um, and I mean, after this, no, before this episode airs, um, this is a nice segue into what you got going on. Mm. Uh, I will have seen Hannah's one woman mm. show. <laughs> so nice. Hannah, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and also elephant in the room. Dawn is not here today. Mm. We will miss her, uh, but she will be back next month. Don't worry. Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Dawn, we miss you we miss and you. baby shrew. Yes. Um, I'm good. Uh, I mean, I kind of mentioned it, but the snow I am just over. Um, so anyone who's not local to Flagstaff, we have gotten literally like record breaking snow. Number so, two <sighs> since they started um Yeah, like recording, literally in record. Yeah, yeah like Over second snowiest. Inches. Yeah, like hurt me at like one forty now or something oh. crazy. Oh, I feel like we're at one oh eight. Oh but my gosh. I have no idea. <laughs> Anywho, a lot of inches. <laughs> Lots of snow. A lot of inches of snow. <laughs> it's literally been since I got back from New York. I think we've had like two to three snow days a week since I got back. And it's just has not let up. Yeah. And it's been crazy. It hasn't been enough time for the snow to melt. Even melt. So it's just piling and piling and mm. piling so much shoveling so much snow blowing it's just insane yeah so and also yeah it's just sad because things are getting canceled like aerial classes and friend hangs and this and that and yeah. my like weekly rituals have just been canceled so that's been really annoying but also in a lot of ways I've been so busy with personal projects and just things that I need to get done that it has been like in a weird way, nice to like have a reason to sit at home because then I've gotten a lot of stuff done, but also sad because I haven't seen a lot of people. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, definitely over winter and ready for some warmth. Ready for that yeah. sunshine and like shorts. Yeah. And- and I, I mean, normally Flagstaff is very sunny, so we're very snowy here, but we also have yeah. um, like a record amount of sunny days. So this is not necessarily the usual. Yeah. So I'm just ready for that because like I don't mind if it's cold as long as it's sunny. That's fine with me. 
Um, well, here's the thing. I don't mind the weather right now because even though it it's – There's I snow mean, it's on the, the same thing. Yeah, there's snow on the ground. But during the day in Flagstaff, it's gorgeous. the sun's out, yeah. like a light jacket is it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> exactly. Like it really yeah. is fine if the sun is out because the Arizona sun comes to play. Yeah. So we're fine. Yeah. Yeah. So just ready for winter to be over. And of course, as Becky mentioned, when this episode drops, my Arizona show will be done, but I will be like – actively in Washington at Island Shakespeare doing my show there. Um, So I'm very excited, but of course, very nervous. Um, Since it's just me, I like rehearse my show just like (laughs) in my room every day. Becky has probably heard the show like nine times already. So I have, but I'm actively trying to (laughs) not not to listen. So the other day when you were doing your show, I put, I wanted to read, but I was like, but I can hear Hannah and I want some things to be a surprise. So I ended up putting on a Netflix movie in just another language just to get just so that there was background noise that I could like focus on so oh that some gosh. things could still be a surprise that is so funny I was like yeah. Becky <laughs> Becky you were literally the first person to buy a ticket thank you so much no there's no way that's true no that is true you Wait. Were, you were the first person to buy a ticket oh my- Oh, wow. I mean, the show is almost sold out. No, but yeah. you were the first person Aww. to buy a ticket. Well, sure. yeah, isn't that so great? So yeah. thank you. Well, I was for sure. I, I for sure because I had texted somebody and I was for sure that that person had already bought their ticket because yeah. I was talking to them about it. And I was you like, came oh, okay. on through. You came on through first. Well, you know so what? thank you, Becky. I will accept this first place. <laughs> yes, you will accept it because you did. Um, yeah. So I'm really excited um, for Ooh. the show. It's. Uh, yeah, it's almost sold out, which I'm just really, really proud of and excited um, that people want to come see the show. And I'm sure there's like six tickets left. So by the time <laughs> the show happens, I'm sure it'll be sold out. Yeah. Um, but I'm really excited just to share my story with everybody. And it's going to be fun. And I'm excited to go to Washington. I mean, I'm a little bit scared just because, you know, of course, it's a lot of singing. Like it's eight <laughs> songs. It's 45 minutes of just me. Um, so it's just a lot of work and it's a lot of like physical work. Um, so, but I'm really excited about it. It's going to be awesome. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like my big thing. Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, just auditioning into the void, (laughs) um, been working on some callbacks and stuff and just hoping to round out my year with a couple of shows and, uh, so we'll see what happens and what I may or may not get. And if I don't get anything, then that's fine, too. But uh, uh, hopefully that audition episode inspired some more people to send out some auditions and kind of really hit the ground running. So I feel like, yeah. yeah, between obviously Flag Shakes and my show and auditioning, I feel like I have a lot of uh, just a lot of stuff going on um a lot of memorizing yeah. and a lot of uh, working on projects and emails and we're getting out of yeah. that like winter slump and i think so yeah i think so uh, yeah i'm starting to see the sun just on the horizon yeah and you know i i've been doing a lot of uh cross training for ariel so i've just been feeling like pretty strong and um, it's been good to get back in the studio after being gone for a couple months and I, oh, I'm becoming a, I don't know if I said this last, uh, last month, but I'm becoming a teacher. So I'm going to start teaching Lyra soon. So I'm like in the apprentice program, uh, here at Momentum. So that's been so fun. And I'm just so excited to start teaching just to spread my love of Ariel, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is exciting. Uh, oh, and my sister had a baby, uh, two days ago. Yay. Yeah. So that's exciting. Jenna. Yes, Jenna, and her baby's name is Birdie. Oh, was that okay that I said? Yeah, no, totally. Her name. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, Jenna has listened <laughs> to definitely the Mamas episode. She's not a theater gal. So, Jenna, if you're listening, hey, sis. Hey, congrats. <laughs> um, yeah, love that gal. Love that gal. Um, yeah, I think that's that's about it. And uh, yeah. uh, just, I guess, uh, Dawn's not here, but she just got back from Yellowstone. Yeah. And she had a great time. Yeah. She filled us in on about that I'm sure she'll tell us about the trip next month but she was so excited to go yeah. to Yellowstone and yeah. see the wolves which we she has talked about that book on the podcast the Yellowstone wolves mm-hmm. uh yeah so I feel like that's that's the main stuff so yeah anywho oh also well something that I realized when I was doing the intro was this is episode 27 Ooh. and you will hear that 27 is a number that uh 
kind of plays into the hedge pig and expand the canon. Oh, you're right. Yeah. And yeah. I'm also 27. Ooh. Ooh, <laughs> some parallels. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Also 27. Wow. <laughs> oh, also, um, I'm working on Shrew Crew merch. <gasps> yes. So hopefully by the time the episode drops, uh, the merch will be available. But it's so cute. Um, so if you're yeah. interested in Shrew Crew merch, that should be dropping soon. And if it's not by March, definitely by the April episode, um, which is very exciting. So yeah. buy some merch, support the Shrew Crew, and also there's Flag Shakes merch too. So buy the merch. Uh, and yeah. yeah. Also, just thank you to everybody who's been listening for two yeah, years. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. 27, 27 episodes. Jinx. Jinx. Again. Give me a soda. <laughs> um, does anyone say that anymore? I'm no. not sure. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, they don't. <laughs> well, anywho, anything else? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Well. Let's get to it. All right, and we are jumping on over to our conversation with the ladies of Hedge Pig. Mm-hmm. Hello, Hedge Pig ladies. How are you? Hello. Oh, we're good. I'm good. <laughs> Sun is shining. <laughs> yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for thanks for the invite. Yeah, of thanks course. for having us. Please introduce yourselves to the Shrew Crew. Hello, I am Emily Lyon, the artistic director of Hedge Pig Ensemble and one of the curators of Expand the Canon. And I'm Shannon Corinthian, and I am the director of production for Hedgehog Ensemble Theater and also a curator of the Expand the Canon. Ooh, did yes. your um, position name change, Shannon? No. <laughs> I've no. been saying it wrong. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. What did I think it was? Producing director. Producing director. Okay. I was mm-hmm. like, what did mm-hmm. I think it was? Okay, wait. Say it one more time. What is it? Director of production. Director of production. Okay, cool. Yep. What is that? mean (laughs) it's great i mean within our company it's since we have an ensemble and we are a you know we produce mostly stage readings that's what i take care of our ensemble kind of like a company manager and also a producer for what we do um in terms of like our list that's getting the rights for our list getting last year we recorded videos so it's getting rights to post the list but also that we can film and Mm. record it and then share it with our public so it's just kind of a mix of producing and company managing yeah do you also oversee like the production elements like the tech stuff or not so much. No, I mean, okay. I kind of hopped in tech for when we filmed and I took care of lighting. Well, took care. I supported lighting if, you know, needs be. But no, I wish I was more savvy with any tech stuff. <laughs> I can figure out my way around a lighting board, but that's about it. Nice. Yeah, and you were great at it, honestly. It was fun. It was yeah. fun. Mm, look at you go. Yeah. Okay, good to know, because I didn't know exactly what your job was. So that is very helpful. Um, Okay, so I would love to just hear more about what Hedge Pig does and what two of you do at Hedge Pig and what Expand the Canon is, because I just know the Shrew crew are going to love what you guys are doing. So tell us a bit about it. Yeah, I mean, I think what Hedge Pig does has shifted over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, We've been around for... I think a decade now, which is kind of nice. Yeah, we celebrated 10 years last fall. Wow, amazing. And when the co-founders, Mary Candler and Gwen Kelso, um, put it together, they were initially calling it like a feminist classical theater company, and they wanted it to be an ensemble where they trained together and created classical work and really highlighted women's voices in leadership which is very fun. Yeah. Um, but for like five, six years, you know, we were doing a lot of Shakespeare mm. through yeah. a feminist lens. Pinter, Ibsen, Chekhov through a feminist lens. And at some point we were like, um, you know, for a feminist classical theater company, we do a lot of plays by dead white guys. Mm-hmm. Um, where are the ones by women? Which is how we created uh, Expand the Canon. And now that's pretty much what we do all the time because we love it. Yeah. And what can you tell the Shrew Crew specifically what the Expand the Canon program and list is? It's a list of nine highly relevant and producible plays. And we talk about what 
you know, relevant and producible is all mm-hmm. the time. I think that that definition not shifts so much as just like evolves mm-hmm. as we go on. Mm-hmm. Um, but nine plays that are written by women across the centuries. Um, I think our oldest one is in the 1600s. 1640. Wow. 1640. Um, but we've read one from the first century. Nice. By wow. Rosvita. And, you know, we choose these plays based on obviously their relevancy, but also the fact that are they what we think is like timely and timeless, um, that they can, that they feel relevant to an audience and that they can be produced in the big stages and the small stages and speak to our experience at large as a whole. Um, And it's not just, you know, old white women from Europe, but it's women from all walks of life, the global majority, and speaking to all of experience that also feels super relevant to like we have a play by an African writer um, if West Sutherland that feels like it could be from about a small town in rural America yeah. right mm-hmm. and those two experiences are super disconnected but that's why we choose this play these plays is because they feel relevant to us in our experience right now yeah wow. and we want to advocate for them to be on classical theater stages on regional theater stages on new york theater stages mm-hmm. um in classrooms you know we as shannon says like we want to expand the definition and the global majority representation and the women's representation um through just our understanding of theater history mm-hmm. right these these women through history um have always been writing They've always been excellent. Mm-hmm. Um, not every one. That's why we carry the list. But <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> a lot of them have been excellent. Um, and it's really important for us, I think, as a theater community, as um, as storytellers, but also just like in the wider zeitgeist to remember that women and non-binary folks have had history that we should appreciate and they have a legacy that they deserve to be honored. And it just rounds the picture up better of our history anyways. Like we know that history is written by white men, but there are so many parts of history that we just don't talk about or that we ignore or that we forget because we forgot a whole section or we ignored a whole section of history because we weren't listening to their voices. So Yeah. Yeah. Or we were maybe um, falsely led to believe like, oh, well, they just weren't doing anything. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's Yeah, women just weren't writing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So (laughs) how... (laughs) <laughs> feelings, strong feelings on that. Strong feelings, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Usually whenever you have to tell somebody to not do something, then they probably were doing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how did you find these plays? Had you studied them in undergrad or um, – oh, actually, I don't know if you went to – I know, right? I'm like, I sure didn't. So, um, And I'm sorry, I don't know if either of you went to grad school. I think you both did. No. I did not. Oh, no. great. Well, never mind. Um, They're just so well-educated <laughs> yeah. ladies. I'm just so smart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they just, like, you know, they just, like, give that that, that vibe. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how did you find these plays? Well, research. I'll talk about how, yes, um, I think one of the things that uh, all of us curators kind of came to the table with was um, a lack of knowledge of these plays. Mm-hmm. Like, that's why we wanted to do yeah. this list, is we didn't know. Um, I think I had read, I'd read... Anne Offerben, The Rover, mm-hmm. uh, which is a problematic title. Um, and also I read like Sophie Treadwell and didn't know if there were many women in between that. Yeah. Um, and at the time when we created this program, I was a reader for the Kilroy's List. And what you do in that process is you just ask, oh, people who know theater, tell me the good titles. What are the good new plays? And so I thought, oh, great. We can just ask people, what are the good old plays? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no one else really knew. Yeah, we were like, mm-hmm. we have none. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had to go do <laughs> research. Yeah, yeah. I I came at it from a, um, an undergrad, I did research on African-American women playwrights and their, um, and their legacies and their stories and their plays from 1916, well, the early 1900s to when I did it, which was 2000, sometimes, mm-hmm. I don't know, <laughs> mid 2010s. And, um, and so when I, when we were talking about ETC and starting this process, that was my kind of leg in of just like, I've seen a few of these and I've read a few of these, but I know that there's so much more and that the brief history that I got to see was rich and vast and hidden because these plays weren't being done and being read. So um, that, 
was kind of my entry into this. And then, yeah, when we did the research, we started reading, people had submitted some things and we started reading them. And then we're like, well, this person talks about, you know, in old plays, they have these prologues and they talk Mm -hmm. about their friends and whatever. And we're like, this person's talking about this person. Let's read their plays. Mm -hmm. And then there were a lot of deep rabbit holes that we went in. I think that first year, the four curators at the time, Mary, Candler, Sky Pagan, Emily Lyon, and myself did so much research and rereading and like hours and hours. And it was during lockdown. So, Ah, you know, we had time. Yeah. But wow, there's a lot of digging and digging to just find some record of the plays that these women wrote. That's actually half the battle. It's like, where do these plays live? Like, what archives are these women's yeah. plays God. sitting in? Yeah. And like, wh- where do we find them? Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You do, you curate nine a year, correct? Yeah. yeah so yeah, a yeah. new list comes out every year. So at mm-hmm. this point, we have three lists, mm-hmm. 2020, 2021, and 2022. Yep. So Shruku, if you're listening, you have access to these expand the canon list. There's now three of nine. So mm-hmm. yeah, 27. Okay. 27. Cool. <laughs> Not math majors, but. Yeah. <laughs> so there are now those 27 plays that have been read by you guys have been vetted you know they're good plays they're producible they're relevant and uh yeah they're like ready to go right now like yeah. uh, have you guys I mean because I've read a few of them but of course not all of them and did you guys do any any editing of these plays like so like with a Shakespeare play obviously it's very common that we don't do the full production of Hamlet, right? Like as yeah. written, we slice it up. So I presume you guys took some liberties and made these like ready to go now. So these are already cut and, you know, ready to go, correct? So there are some that, um, not all of them, almost all, many of the plays are still under copyright for various reasons, oh, okay. which is either that, um, cause our list goes up to 1976. Gotcha, so, okay. Yeah. Um, and some are translations of older plays as well. Right. Um, so we can't do that for all of them. Oh, gotcha. Um, the other thing is we do want to provide people with access to like the play. Right. Um, but that said, there are a bunch of plays that are under public domain, um, where you can go find a suggested cut of that play gotcha. available at Expand the Canon. Okay, okay. cool. Yeah. I didn't just want to clap oh, yeah. for Emily because she does so much of that cutting Yay. and it, it is really, really well done. Yeah. Thank incredible. You. I didn't realize that um, you, the list came all the way up to 1976. That's awesome. Yeah. I, actually, this kind of leads to the next or, or a possible question is like, I know you guys use the cute little catchphrase. What is a classic? I don't know if I butchered it, but like, you know, when you said 1976 in my brain, I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. I didn't think it was that modern, modern to mm. me, yeah. you know, to me, anything really like 1950s onward, like I consider that contemporary or modern in my little brain and so Mm -hmm. like what is a classic y'all like let's talk about it so like whenever we say what's a classic yeah we left we list off Shakespeare Chekhov Ibsen like to us that's what a classic is but like what is the definition of a classic like that's totally objective I think and I love that you guys are challenging that so yeah what do we think a classic is well we kind of shifted from classical to, and classic, we make that that distinction, mm, right? Okay. Of like classical piece of text are the Greeks, the Shakespeare's, mm, all that stuff. Okay. Um, the things that when you think about, you think of like stuffy British people <laughs> <Yeah>. doing. <laughs> yeah. <Corny-tony. laughs> yeah. Um, but a classic, what we kind of talk about in our in our spaces is something that feels timely, that feels um, always relevant, and that always feels that it speaks to a human experience, a human truth, mm-hmm. right? Whether that just be like love and innocent romance or deep tragedy, um, that speaks yeah. to an emotion that we all can relate to. And that, yeah, that's that's what I feel like we've come to when we talk about classic. So it's more about yeah. thematic than it is about timeline or setting. A little bit, um, I don't know. I don't necessarily know that setting has to factor in. Um, but I, the two touch points that I always go back to um, are one that we consider August Wilson to be a black classic. Mm. And he's writing in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. Um, you know, and so if we think about time, like, yeah, um, 
I'll just leave that there. I think that's a really <laughs> interesting point. And it's about what continues to resonate as mm -hmm. kind of what Shannon was was saying. But we've also like looked up the definition of classic. And what I love in that is a work of recognized and established value. And I think what we are trying to do with Expand the Canon is to solidify the established value yeah. that these plays have and should have um and are advocating for for that to be better recognized um i love great. that like yeah. you are literally saying these plays have value we are telling you they have value they are producible they are good plays they're a classic now like yeah. we've decided it is what it is like you know full stop these are classics because they do have value and they're great plays and these women deserve even if they died hundreds of years ago like these shows deserve a chance it's so i'm so curious to know with some of these plays if they were maybe never produced at all like, do you guys have any form of mm. historical accounts on some of these plays that, like, have these plays just been hidden in an archive literally for hundreds of years and no one's produced them? Or have they actually been produced a decent amount? There are a few. I mean, there are a few when we read them when we're curating. They're like, this play has never gotten a production or this play was produced once. Um, this play was only read to a few people yeah. this one time and never got its time on stage. Um, or this play, I think about the drag and, you know, this play was done. It caused a riot. It was never mm -hmm. done again. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of, I think Emily can speak better to some of these, but there are a few that you're just like, this is this is a classic and we're saying it's a classic and yet it has never touched the stage. It has never touched people's ears more than like one time. Right. Yeah. Um, That's crazy. Although I will also like say like there are a number of plays that really did get a lot of recognition and, um, production in their day so mm -hmm. it's it's a really interesting mix of some plays like one that was in a weird archive until um i think the 70s um it was sitting in like a cornell library and it was mm -hmm. filed under like law books what? because <laughs> yeah um because the subtitle has like a reference to lawyer, lawyer. the lawyer jilted um and they were like mm -hmm. oh surely it's a law book no <laughs> oh, i didn't um, even bother it, it was like it, yeah oh it's a super body play um <laughs> that's so, so funny. that's fun but a lot of these shows really did like the show we're doing a reading of this month um a bold stroke for a husband was performed at covent garden mm -hmm. and like wow people really enjoyed it. And of course they did, because it's a great play. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it's an interesting combo of no matter if a woman was celebrated in her time or if she was forgotten um, or not acknowledged even then, like both have been kind of ignored. And uh, I would say if you haven't read Bold Stroke yet, give it a read, <laughs> y'all. Yeah. It is so funny. I can't handle it. <laughs> there are two Bold Strokes. Yes. Bold Stroke for husband, Bold Stroke for wife. Bold Stroke for a Wife is great, but okay. Bold Stroke for a Husband is being done in like three places this yes, year. So if you want to hop yeah. on that train, yeah. read Hannah Cowley's play. It's is, so funny. Is Bold Stroke for a Wife also being produced that you know of? I feel like I saw. Yeah. Okay, because yeah. I'm sure I saw um, a poster for it and it had Husband crossed off and Wife like written over it. Oh, cute. Right? Yeah. Um, well, there's, I think, maybe a couple things, because we did, our poster does have Tammy the Shrew crossed off oh, and yes. written Bold Stroke for a Husband. Oh, maybe um, that's what I'm thinking of. Because Bold Stroke for a Husband is, does have a literal reference to yeah. Taming of the Shrew and how it's very I similar. sort of love this moment yeah. being like, Catherine, ugh, please, she was nothing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you think but... she was a shrew. <laughs> <laughs> Just you wait. Yeah. Um, which is, of course, not at all how the play really is, but, uh... <laughs> Eileen Huber, who we also know from Sta, mm -hmm. um, is directing a production of Bold Stroke for oh, a wife, nice. okay. um, or just directed it, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they're happening. both getting their due. Nice. Yeah. Woo. Oh yeah, we didn't really say how we met. <laughs> so, <laughs> how do we know each other? <laughs> how do we know each other? So you know, the Shrew Crew has heard us talk about the Shakespeare Theater Association plenty of times. That was why I was in the Bahamas. I went last year too in Pennsylvania and I not met the these Bahamas. Yeah, <laughs> not the Bahamas. Different vibe. I met these incredible ladies last year in Harrisburg and we just really hit it off and uh, have become really close girlfriends and uh 
also with including Olena Hodges from Island Shakespeare. And together we create what we call the coven. Um, <laughs> because at one point we were so inseparable at the conference. Again, I don't remember who said it. Does yeah, any remember who said it? Who said it? No. Uh, someone was like, where's your coven? Because I like arrived somewhere alone. <laughs> And they were like, where's the rest of the coven? And I was like, oh, my gosh, it's staying. <laughs> so we are the stock coven now. Um, I and I just love what you guys are doing. So that's like a little bit of background of how we know each other. Um, anywho. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, really great play. That leads me to my, my other question. Obviously, I'm recommending Bold Stroke because I love it. But if you were going to say like your favorite, maybe three, like to start with, maybe across all the lists, like what are your favorite Expand the Canon plays that you've read that you're just like, these ones are so good not to be missed? I love this question because there's so many. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm sure it's a hard question. I mean, again, read the list because there's 27 to choose from. But if just personally, what are both of your favorites? I think if you're looking for a like, not intro to these plays, but more of an ease in, Mm -hmm. I would go House of Desires. Mm. Francoise and then maybe if you're wanting to up the game Anima which is from the first two lists but if you're trying to like hit hard right away I would do Le Blanc Mm. um, and the Soul Shell Dance and maybe like Wedding Band or the Fumika and She One Axe Oh my gosh, these are so yeah. many. All of these names. Yeah, like, there's a Ooh. lot of titles. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> these titles are great. Yeah, they're intriguing. You said, was it My Soul Shall Dance? Yeah. And, uh, and The Soul Shall Dance. And The Soul Shall Dance. And Wedding like, Band wow. gives like makes me like, ooh, does that mean Wedding Band? Or does that mean Wedding Band? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um. <laughs> nice. Okay, yeah. okay. Those are Shannon's top six. Emily. I mean... I have to just frankly <laughs> absolutely co-sign Shannon's list. Yeah. Um, I if I had to pick three, which I hate that idea, but also you, we've sort of given Bold Stroke for a husband a bump, yes, so that like totally. technically it's four. Um, <laughs> I would also 100% agree with uh, House of Desires, um, Los Empeños de una Casa, um, which is the same thing. The Spanish, Spanish name of House of Desires. Um, yeah. gotcha. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. Le Blanc, which if I could force everyone in America to read one play, it would be Le Blanc. Okay. Um, and I think we would, I know we would all be better for it. Uh, <laughs> and okay, since we already took Bold Stroke for Husband off, um, or I'm claiming it as a freebie, I would mm, also say Anima. It. I think Anima's so good. Uh, okay. So good. But so they're we, all good. Which they're is all really good. You yeah. should go they're to on the that website list. and be like, because <laughs> we have pitches of like, if you like this, then you'll probably also. Totally. Like yes. Else. So we try to make yeah. it. Yeah. The way okay. that the way the way the list is structured is really lovely. Like, you know, you can kind of go through and like since I obviously know I like Shakespeare, when you guys told me about Bold Stroke and you obviously mm-hmm. explained like that it ha- that it's similar to Taming of the Shrew, but then when you read it, it obviously has so many other Shakespearean elements. Like it's basically taming Twelfth Night as you like. Like it's like four plays in one, sort <laughs> of. It, it just has so many similar themes, and um, so I love the way it's structured. Yeah, like if you like this, you might like this, which yeah. is awesome. But it sounds like you guys like sort of similar ones, so it, you know those seem to be like really a Top really racks. good place to stop. Start, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when you're looking, th- um, when you're reading these plays, or and or when you're um, cutting the ones that you're able to cut or uh, finagle the ones that you can do you also update language Um, because I know that's Mm -hmm. a thing with Shakespeare is some of the language is a little or not a little sorry some of the language is problematic today yeah and do you find that you're seeing like parallels in other shows from that same time period yeah Yeah. (laughs) short answer yes I think you know the past is all the The isms right so like there is so much problematic language in all of these texts it's just Mm, not all of them but m- many. a lot of them a lot of them there's sure, well yeah. like the ones that are older right um just remembering the context and when they were written and emily does we like talk about what what language doesn't fit the our current modern context um but yeah, it, it I, wasn't just shakespeare it was across the board it was across the board yeah very much so i mean even in bold Stroke for a husband there's only one thing that i edited out for problematicness mm-hmm. um but also just clarity, uh, 
True. Like I, I didn't know what a Jews harp was, um, but apparently that is a musical instrument that I am oh. unfamiliar with. And okay. unfortunately it's like set up for one absolutely like stupid Jew joke, yeah. which is so un- inappropriate and not meaningful and takes away from like the beauty and the hilarity and the everything else of this play, yeah. but is so edit outable. Um, yeah. So there yeah. is, I have replaced it in my suggested cut with the word kazoo instead. Oh because, my gosh. Oh. It's the, not the original? Is now, Emily. It's not original. The kazoo. Kazoo. Invented until I'm not sure when. Um, <laughs> Emily, I was literally just telling Becky yeah. about the kazoo joke. <laughs> Literally, she was like, "Like I should read Bold Stroke," and I yeah. just for like five minutes diatribed <laughs> about the kazoo joke. <laughs> it's so it becomes funny. a good joke once you once we've updated it to be an an equivalent. It's so funny, um, but yeah, no, it's a hilarious play. Yeah, it's just like the same way that you know, there's so many things that you're like, okay, the monkey and the pancakes, and as you like it, and everyone's yeah, like, like, we we don't I, know. I don't Even the Arden is like, yeah. nobody knows what the heck this is about anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah, just exactly. like update it to something that people will recognize. Right. Yeah, yeah, an um, archaic reference yeah. is not funny no matter what. If everyone goes, what? Yeah. Like, yeah. It, like if they don't get it, it's not going to be funny. Even if it's actually hilarious, like we don't know. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Good yeah. to know. Neat. Sort of along these lines, just like pick every, picking everyone's brains, how can we support women in the arts? You know, like obviously these plays were written, um, some of these plays were written a long time ago, but what can we do right now, you know, to make sure that women playwrights are, you know, actually being produced and obviously female performers and um, yeah, just what can we do to, I, I think we're seeing a lot of amazing changes, you know, even just since, you know, I graduated school, um, just like women in leadership, you know, has, has changed so much. And, you know, I, I, I've told this story on the pod and I've said it to so many friends, but like half the reason that I wanted to work for flag shakes is when I found the website, you know, I saw Dawn's picture on the website and I was like, oh my gosh, this company's being run by a young woman. Like, this is crazy. Like I want to work there. Um, and I always like credit that for why I wanted to work for flag shakes. And, you know, even since then, which was six or seven years ago, things have changed a lot. Like women in leadership Mm -hmm. is a lot more common now in the theater world. So I think we are making some really great strides, but like, what are the things that we can do just to continue that incredible growth? I mean, the first instinctual answer is just like produce these plays yeah. right like the, <laughs> yeah. we there everything's there for you produce it which we say a lot um but i think this you know these yeah. times the male whatever is happening in the within the patriarchy they're uplifting each other they're supporting each other they're bringing each other on their podcast they're mm-hmm. funding their whatever um we know how it works so it's just doing it for the women in our lives and the women we know who are leaders and who are um artists and who are doing good work is just uplifting their work yeah. for our communities or within our circles i think to just i mean this are what we found at Sta, which is this really mm. great coven yeah. um, and we've been able to do really Really great things like being on this podcast, having Bold Truck for a Husband being directed in Seattle in Seattle. Yeah. Um, and that's that's what the boys club does. So we just need to do the same thing. Support each other. And yeah. Better, yeah. Yes. And to exactly Shannon's point, um, you know, lifting up what we each do. Uh, we also have a mm-hmm. podcast. Yeah. So we'll give ourselves yeah. a plug. Yeah, um, absolutely. Called This Is a Classic, <laughs> uh, where you can go hear about all of our plays if you um, don't want to commit to reading 27 of them. Um, <laughs> and you can then listen to us talk about each of them and decide which one you do want to read and then produce and then tell all your friends about. <laughs> uh, so that would be great. Um, you know, you can also go to our website and um, hang out read, produce them, <laughs> advocate for them, and donate. We Absolutely. also have fun merch if you want some some Ooh. merch. You want to help walk around and be a billboard for us. That would be great. <laughs> and you can um, become a reader, right? Can you become yeah, a you reader? Can. Yeah, you can nominate either yourself or someone else to our reading committee, which is sort of the first line of defense on reading these plays. Um, we typically have at least around 35 uh, folks on that committee helping us for the first time take a look at this play that maybe no one has read in a couple hundred years or maybe somebody read like last week we don't know (laughs) (laughs) again we don't know wow 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, rising tides raise all boats. And I think right. something that I've learned that I, I'm just going to like, I'm just so proud of my own growth because when I was in college, like the way I had kind of been taught was like other women are threats. Other mm-hmm. women are, if they get something, I'm losing something. Yeah. If another girl gets that role, that's not good for her. That's bad for me. Mm-hmm. She is my direct threat. Are we yeah. the same type? Are we this? Are we both blondes? Like, it does not matter. Like, I, I'm i just so glad that I kind of grew out of that because, like, so I even look at, like, Becky and I. We're very, very similar when it comes to, like, body type. Like, if we were next to each other, we're very similar. But Becky and I are nothing alike. You know, mm-hmm. like, the way we perform, what we do best, it, it's just not the same. And when I was younger... I would have been like, oh my gosh, she's a threat to me, right? And her getting something is me losing something. And I'm just so glad that I grew out of that. I get I think it was, you know, part a part of the theater world that we're starting to let go, but I'm just so happy to see my girlfriends doing really cool stuff. Yeah. That only helps me because yeah. my girlfriends doing cool stuff means that maybe they're going to bring me on board in a couple of years or if they need help with something, I'm the one they turn to, you know, like it just, I, I love that you said that. Like, I think that that's what we need to be going towards, you know, like even mm-hmm. just this morning, like Becky sent me something, an opportunity this morning. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, like, and I text my my girlfriends whenever I see an audition come up or something. I'm not like, oh my gosh, I need to yeah. not let anybody know about it because what if they get it instead of me? It's like, no, if my best girlfriend gets it, that's great. I'm so happy for her. So I think that's, yeah, that's what we need to be thinking about. And, you know, the let's start the girls club, but in the girls club... <laughs> <laughs> whenever <laughs> whenever anyone is successful yeah. that's great for all of yeah. us and yeah. I just think that's yeah I that's what I loved about getting to know you gals and I mean it, it has directly benefited me like I'm doing a show at Island Shakespeare that's very exciting like yeah and that would have never happened had I not opened myself to, up to you guys and up to mm. Olina and you know gotten to know each other and been vulnerable and enjoyed each other just as friends first yeah. you know and that's that's so amazing so I love that um oh Gina sent us something we can play their game, but we don't have to play by their rules. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Issa Rae said something. She was interviewed and people were asking her, like, why do you, it seems like you network down or whatever. Mm. Like, why are you helping people who, or why are you, yeah, getting to know or helping people who are in a lower standing in their career than you? And why aren't you networking up? And she was like, I'm not, I, I'm very much so paraphrasing what she said, but she was like, everybody talks about networking up, but no one talks about networking across, like yeah, looking next yeah. to you and who's there because those are the people on the ground working with you. Like right. you can keep looking up all you want, but first of all, they're looking down at you for yeah. one. I don't think she said this, but second, those are the people who will be working with you in the future and who you want by your yeah. side. Like it mm-hmm. makes no sense yeah. to ignore this next person because they're not at a, they don't have a title that you want or whatever. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. So many people become successful later in life or get that one chance and ignoring that just because they're not there yet is, yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah. It's not fair. I say this all the time. uh, These two things, one, um, like just because somebody is with some company or in some position right now does not mean they're going to be there in two, three, five, 10 years. Like everyone, it's such a fluid business. And um, the other thing is that like, everyone works with everyone. Yeah. So it, yeah, like t- to put somebody into like this box because you met them at this one point in their life and you don't deem it necessary or worthy to like mm-hmm. cultivate a relationship just isn't right. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was graduating college, my stage management professor, um, he's a man, but I remember him selling, saying to my parents, uh, he's like, she could be my boss like in yeah. 10 years. Like, or I mean, not even in 10 years. I think he was just like, one day she could be my boss. And it's like, right now I'm your student. But yeah, this business is just so, so fluid. fluid. Yeah. So fluid. And you know, I always like to say like, the world is so big, but the world is so small. Like, yeah. especially in the theater world, mm. you know, we just start to go loop, 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 loop. And it just yeah. gets smaller and smaller. And especially like when we're looking across, you know, Shakespeare companies or classic companies, like it just starts to like, 
yeah becomes so much tighter especially like when you go to sta you're like yeah. oh my gosh it's the same 40 people <laughs> and these people run these companies but they all work with each other and yeah. they direct here and they direct and yeah. they've acted at these 10 companies and they're all connected because those are best friends and those companies they're run by two people who went to school together so you know yeah. like and it all just starts to like Everything spider connects. web yeah you mm-hmm. know you know i also i do want to say like of course like let's raise up women but you know here on untamed shrews we bring on men all the time you know and men can be incredible allies as well like um i know there's a, incredible guys that listen to this podcast and i want them to know that like they're doing great work too because they're supporting us and i want to support them you know in tandem and um so i don't know is that controversial not sure sure <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons that it's expand the canon, not wipe mm. out the canon. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, plays by men that I still love. Like, it's not yeah. like, ah, oh, now that I like dead lady plays, I only read those. I mean, that <laughs> right. actually is true. I, I mostly do only read those. Okay, but, but dead lady um, plays? Dead lady wow, plays. what a name. Like, dead lady that's plays. my band name. That's the name of my company, like my book. Wow. <laughs> um, although I will also say, like, I don't know of any men yet who have been the ones advocating and mm. demanding that we produce these plays. Ooh. So if you are that first man who is like, and I decided that we needed to do uh bold show for husband or yeah. the drag or the something tell us we would love to celebrate yeah. you for celebrating yeah. these plays also okay great love that yeah yeah no i don't think that's controversial but i agree that there's until i mean not until we have proof but like 100 <laughs> percent. like come and come to the table we're not saying yeah. we're not saying replace we're we're saying make room yeah <laughs> you know yeah. like that's great bring not bring us to the table we can bring you to our table yeah, I yeah. like the I love the word make make room. That's great. Yeah. 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 And I think, yeah, expand I didn't even think about that. You're right. Expand the canon, not, not replace the canon. Yeah. Because yeah. no, obviously cause we, the- we are Shakespeare companies. <laughs> like that's what we love. That's what we do. And um we love his work. Uh sure. and this is just adding to the mix, not saying we can't do Shakespeare anymore. This is okay, you do four shows a year. Can one of those be one of these plays? And the other three can be Shakespeare. But we just start to throw these in the mix, you know, and they yeah. become more commonplace. And I hope that Bold Stroke becomes, a, you know, a name that everyone recognizes because Agreed. it's so good. I also say, though, with classic theater companies and Shakespeare, sometimes I say this, maybe this, what I'm about to say is controversial, but I feel, mm-hmm. especially at Star and the conversations we were having, it's like, well, how many times are we going to do Hamlet? Or when everybody mm-hmm. was like, yeah, everybody was doing Merchant for like 18 months for some reason. <laughs> and if you throw in more plays, then you make that season more varied and you don't have 15 theaters across the Western seaboard <laughs> that are doing Merchant, right? right. You maybe yeah. have two. And that also, Deborah, diversifies your audience, makes when you do a play more exciting and you bring more communities and more audience because that's the issue that we're all having, right? It's like no one's coming to see the theater because it's expensive, blah, blah, blah. And everybody feels like they've seen Mm -hmm. this play before. Then diversify your own season and more people will come because it'll be more exciting when you do this play again. Mm -hmm. Because if you've done Hamlet in the last five years and then you're doing it again, what it, why should I come back and see it? Like, what is different? The story hasn't changed, (laughs) you know? Hamlet on the moon. <laughs> Hamlet on the moon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, like we tell, we've been telling the same stories over and over and sometimes in new ways, sometimes in not, but why not just tell new stories? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, exactly. I mean, so. and I think that there's also, I think that that's where a lot of people go is tell new stories. Um And a lot of theaters that have Shakespeare, like that are primarily Shakespeare companies also have a new works program. And so a lot of the time, like the first year we went to Sta, people were like, oh, I do new plays. We should talk. And I was like, sorry, I just knew to us. Yeah. New to us plays, not necessarily written in the past year. Yeah. Oh, 100 (laughs) percent. But it has been shocking to me how often we have had to tell people that that they don't know these existed building on um what shannon was saying too about like diversifying your season and also that that's much more compelling um for an audience and like who you're talking to be in conversation with them but i think it also really requires or asks theaters to expand who their audience is Mm -hmm. you know the people that wanted 
the people that might want to see plays by women through history, the people that might want to see a play by an African writer in the 60s might be different than the people that you've been asking right. to go see your fourth version of Hamlet. And yeah. how can you so true. actually be in conversation with that community that maybe hasn't come to your theater? How can you really intentionally engage um, expanding your your canon and expanding your audience and doing that in an authentic way rather than um sort of a, a check box or a hope that just by doing the show that those people will show up mm -hmm. i think i think it does it does invite um a new next level of engagement um yeah. and i think not every theater has the bandwidth to do that right now but i think if we want to survive and if we want to be the industry that we say we want to be, it's going to take that deliberate expansion of audience as well. Being like, very intentional. I love it. Oh, well, my gals, <laughs> we are almost out of time. So what I would love before we let you go is anything else you want to tell us about Hedge Pig, Expand the Canon, and also how can people get involved? How can people find you? Both you as humans and, you know, the company as well. Like, we didn't really get too much into, like, your individual backgrounds and hyphens and, you know, obviously, Emily, I know you direct. And uh, so, like, what are the different things that you guys are up to and how can we find you and how can we work with you so we can raise your boats? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you can find about all about Expand the Canon and Hedgepig at expandthecanon.com or um, hedgepigensemblefeater.com.org. All of the things. Just type us in Google and you'll find us. Um, I'm currently trying to stay off social media, so don't mm -hmm. go looking for me there. <laughs> <laughs> Please Lose don't. my number. But, <laughs> but you could probably still find me on like LinkedIn and all that good stuff. And I love reading plays. I'm an actor. I'm a producer. Um, so, you know, I'm also just a fun person to chat with. So come chat with me. Yeah. Cosign. Shannon's also <laughs> in our reading for Bold Stroke for Husband. Oh, playing nice. Victoria. Yes, and I'm yes. excited to, to see her on the stage again. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know why I went into like weird 1940s and episodes. No, so did I. <laughs> I know, we're getting in, we're starting rehearsal stage. this week. We're getting in, you know, in character. Yes. <laughs> and my yes. character is the director that no one will hear from <laughs> on the day. Um, but anyway, uh, yes, I um, am a director. I'm a dramaturg. That's why I cut these plays. Um, I now have a weird love of spreadsheets from this database that we run. <laughs> um, I, what else do I do? Other things, <laughs> lots of things. You can find out more about them at my website, which is emilyalion.com. Um, but yeah, if you want to keep learning more about Hedgepig and Expand the Canon, as Shannon said, expandthecanon.com is great. Um, you can find our podcast, This is a Classic, mm -hmm. anywhere that you are listening to this. Um, <laughs> And it, unless you're listening to it on your website, we, which is possible, it's not there. Yeah. Or, um, YouTube or, <laughs> or also sunsounds.org. Yes. Plug for sun sounds. <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah, join our reading committee, read the plays, talk to us. Honestly, just send us an email and be like, I loved this play or I hate this play or anything. Mm -hmm. Just talk to us. You can email yeah. me. I'm emily at hedgebigensemble.org. And if you're local it. to the New York area, you know, when I was in New York, I did actually get to make it to one of your readings. So, yeah. you know, yeah. try to try to go to Brooklyn and see a reading. Join yeah. our mailing list. Yeah. Meet some yeah. people. Oh, sweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Well, my gals, it was just so yes. lovely to see your faces. First off, I miss you so much. <laughs> Thanks for being here. It was great to uh, meet you both. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great to meet you. Great yeah. to meet you. Hannah, I wish I could see your show. Yeah. <sighs> I'm so excited. I mean, I get to see Olina in a week. Yeah. So exciting. Which is yeah. so exciting. So that's thrilling. Um, but I am hoping to come to New York maybe in like May just to like say hello so yeah hopefully but anyway thank you so much for listening to this month's episode of untamed shrews i'm hannah and i'm becky join us next time in april for an episode with raquel mckenzie about our upcoming spring play single black female 
Follow Untamed Shrews on our Instagram at Untamed Shrews Podcast and on the Flag Shakes website. All episodes of Untamed Shrews can be found wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on sunsounds.org and the Flag Shakes YouTube. Please subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, put us in your Instagram stories, donate at flagshakes.org slash donate, or DM us about becoming a podcast sponsor. Help support the Shrew Crew. Woo! This episode of Untamed Shrews, starring Becky Zeritsky, Hannah Fonts, Emily Lyon, and Shannon Corinthian. Show art by Calliope Ludecker. Podcast theme song by Cadence Lamb. Podcast produced and edited by Hannah Fonts. Presented by Flagstaff Shakespeare Festival and recorded with Sun Sounds of Arizona. Special thanks to our audio engineer, Gina Byers. Bye, everyone. Bye. Woo! Yay. Yay! Miss you. Love you. Miss Bye. You. <laughs> <laughs>